All right, we are underway. This is Glenn Lowry, Glenn Show at bloggingheads.tv, sponsored by the Watson Institute for International and Public Affairs, where I'm a professor here at Brown University. And I am with Peter Moskos of the John Jay College of Criminal Justice in New York City, where Peter is an associate professor uh, in the Department of Law, Police Science, and Criminal Justice Administration. I didn't actually know that official department name until just now. It's a but, mouthful, uh, isn't it? But it's the it's the flagship of John Jay College of Criminal Justice. Peter is, if you don't know. And, and I just have to, if I can plug it right now, we're hiring. If you want, uh, <laughs> uh, there's a job posting up, one for assistant professor, tenure track, two lecture positions. Uh, go to the CUNY website to find it. Uh, C U N Y and uh, and uh, apply. It's uh, it's open till the end of the year for starting in the fall of next year. Okay, now are you telling me that uh, applicants for assistant professor positions in the John Jay College are so scarce that you need to advertise for them uh, on this venue? I don't know. I want I want a, a broad and diverse pool, Glenn, and 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 it all helps. You know, people, I, I Peter must people be chairman of the hiring committee or something. You guys, are you? <laughs> yeah, yes, I am. <laughs> Okay, well, uh, we are here, uh, and uh, uh, Peter is a uh, uh, PhD in sociology, Harvard, if I'm not mistaken, a Princeton undergraduate, uh, Ivy League credentials, and a former uh, cop. Did you not serve for some time as a police officer on the beat in Baltimore, uh, Maryland? I did, indeed. It was a very brief time, 20 months in total. I got civil service protection and quit, uh, but it was all part of my graduate school research. Um, so I, I went went there for about two years and uh, I got a PhD and wrote a book about it. So um, that that's a pretty good I'm, book, a book called Cop in the Hood, uh, where Peter is reflecting uh, using both the uh, benefit of his academic training, but also his uh, experience on the ground with police in Baltimore to uh, have some smart things to say about urban policing in contemporary America. And on uh, December 6th, had I stayed there, it would have been, that would be 20 years. Wow, it's been that long. <laughs> Time flies. Time flies when you're teaching classes, Glenn. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I, I've, I've been doing this since 1976, so <laughs> quite a bit of time has flown. <laughs> but in any case, uh, what are we talking about? We're talking about policing uh, in uh, contemporary America, I guess. We're talking about, ah, I want to talk to you. You're right there in New York City. Former Mayor Michael Bloomberg uh, has uh, given very strong indications that he's starting uh, thinking about on the verge of uh, launching a presidential campaign, a Democratic Party for the nomination. And what would appear to be a part of his preparatory activity was a speech that he gave at a uh, African-American church in Brooklyn uh, recently in which he uh, discussed stop and, and frisk. Uh, in fact, not only did he discuss it, he apologized. He said he was sorry. He said he got something important, very badly wrong uh, with his stop and frisk policy. And I'm and I'm just interested in what a, a smart observer of uh, New York City policing and uh, more generally of the sort of urban uh, order, order maintenance problem in uh, contemporary America uh, thinks about that. Well, uh the short answer is I think he does have something to apologize for. The long answer is, of course, more nuanced because what happened in New York with stop, question and frisk um, is not, as many people interpret it, is not a knock against police actually legally stopping people. Um, those are two separate issues. Um, stop and question and frisk in New York was different than what happened in Chicago. In Chicago in 2016, when police basically stopped stopping people, it was different than happened in Baltimore in 2015 when the same thing happened. What happened in New York was somewhat unique. Um, and Bloomberg gave Kelly, the police commissioner, free reign. He, you know, do what you need to do. He, he did, he did not get, get actively in, Bloomberg did not get actively involved in police matters. At some point in New York City, and that point was roughly, let's say 2020. 2010, though it goes before and after that a few years. Um, the CompStat tail started wagging the NY police dog and they started counting stops, ironically, in the law of, you know, watch what you wish for, because um, the NYCOU 
demanded that they keep accurate count of these stops. So once they said we are going to count these stops, we're going to use it as a measure to judge police officer productivity. And that's when the, the wheels came off the cart. Um, so basically stops. What year was that? Uh, excuse me, Peter. When um, was that? The I don't know, but let's let's say around the numbers really started going up around 2004, 2005 um, and they skyrocketed. And it was the question wasn't, why are we stopping someone? It just became about numbers. It became a quota game. All stops are good. More stops are better. Um, Stops that didn't happen were being made up. Uh, If you did a car stop, you might do a fill out a stop form um, at an you, I mean, you could, you could, the forms were just getting filled out because they were seen as good by the police department. Um, I had students come to my class and say, you know, they were stopped on the way to school and were asking, well, why don't they stop the drug dealers who are actually hanging out in the lobby of the public housing houses where I live? Um, <laughs> and I said, I don't know, why aren't they? And they said, well, because I'm an easier target because I'm not going to resist. I'm an easy stop and they're afraid of the drug dealers. I don't know if they're afraid of them, but but it became just a question of, of producing these numbers. I can tell you this, and I've said this before at Blogging Heads, although it's been years ago. Uh, I visited as a scholar at Columbia University 2010-2011 academic year and lived um, on Malcolm X Boulevard in Harlem at 113th Street and was stopped riding my bicycle from the front door of my apartment to the curb at the end of the block where I was intending to get onto the street and go up the hill to Morningside Heights. I was stopped uh, and, you know, forced to produce identification and given a citation for riding my bicycle on the sidewalk. Uh, and, you know, I don't think I looked like a very menacing uh, force out there at that time. Um, for what it's so, worth, yeah. I was stopped also on my bicycle on the sidewalk. I, I, no kidding. How about that? Yeah. But hold I mean, on, let me get this I, I was able now. to talk my way out of it, though. <laughs> You're saying there was an irony of unintended consequences in that liberal critics of the stop question and fist program had demanded accountability in terms of record keeping of stops. And that what that uh, got uh, changed into was a a management device uh, where police uh, productivity was being measured by numbers available, including the numbers of stops. And then it, uh, so a de facto quota of police officers having to or being incentivized to engage in stops. And these stops were not productive in terms of, uh, you know, uh, uh, inhibiting uh, law breaking and uh, increasing public safety. In hindsight, we can say they weren't Um, at the time. If certainly if you ask cops, uh, they would have said each one of those 700,000 stops at the peak year was absolutely essential to prevent the city from turning into, you know, an 80s escape from New York disaster zone. Um, We know that's not true in hindsight. Um, we also during the period when stops um, went up and peaked, crime wasn't going down in New York. That's is an interesting. I mean, so this is you know this is twenty twenty hindsight. But once uh, the stops were drastically cut back, um, murders dropped as well. Uh, so hold on, hold on, murders were not declining as stops were going up, but started to decline as stops went down. There was a, of course a period of massive crime decline in the nineties. Uh, yeah. And that, and then, and then there was sort of a latency period between 2004, 2010. Um, and I don't have these stats right in front of me, though I could mm-hmm. get them. Um, so I could be off by a couple of years uh, in these details. But there was a leveling out of murder. And I, I primarily look at murders and shootings because I trust those data for reliability reasons. Yeah. Um, and then when um, the lawsuit came about and when de Blasio, 2013, 2014, uh, 2015, there was another I think one third drop, maybe one quarter, third, let's say, let's compromise, say 30% drop in murders in a two year period. And nobody took credit for it. It was sort of a secret drop. The cops didn't want to take credit for it because they said the city was going to go to hell. Um, I don't know. No, no one seemed to understand why. I mean, that, even that was a mystery to me. I can, I can ramble on and explain the 90s crime drop, that, that little drop, but it was a significant drop uh, that brought murders below 300 in New York City. Um, that was an odd one. Um, so we know we know these these things in hindsight, but he, here's the thing I want to emphasize is that the stops that cops were doing because they felt pressured to make stops were not productive, whether legal or not. And some were many were legal and, and, and many were not legal. And that's based on a reasonable suspicion standard. Um, they were stopping people to get numbers. What you need and, and what continued to happen is cops were still stopping people. They They actually thought were productive stops based on reasonable suspicion. So it wasn't that all stops stopped. 
It was that unnecessary stop, stop. It was a quota based stop, stop. Um, and that's why the city didn't go to hell because you did not see the depolicing here that you saw in cities like Chicago and Baltimore. It was just this, you know, 700,000 stops down to, you know, were cut down by 90% or something. Um, so in that sense, yeah, Bloomberg does have something to apologize for because he let that happen. And we know in hindsight, I, I think at the time he thought it was needed and it was productive. We know we know now it wasn't. And many people then said it wasn't. So you got to give them credit to the opponents of, of, of stop, question and frisk. Um, but it's not like cops here just sit in their cars all, all day anymore, though. Um, other factors that we can get into recent events, I think, are more worrisome in some ways. But so Bloomberg was right to apologize, but he's not, you know, he, he should not back down entirely from his record. Um, he was a very good mayor in terms of public safety. Um, and, you know, and he deserves credit for that. He didn't, he didn't start that um, and he didn't necessarily finish it, but, you know, he okay. was. So, so I have remarked this uh, publicly and I'm not sure I know what I'm talking about when I say it. My, my uh, narrative is in the 1990s, uh, at the peak of this thing, there were over 2,000 people a year getting killed in New York City. And at the uh, uh, bottom of this uh, decline, it was under 400 a year. That seems like an extraordinary transformation of the ecology or the climate of interpersonal violence in a city. Absolutely. I mean, more than could be accounted for by any single policy. But I'm wondering how, as someone who studies this for a living, you get your head around that kind of transformation. Who, if anybody, deserves credit for that? What what role does policing play in the story that we're going to tell about where that uh, transformation uh, came from? Um, I think a huge amount. Now, I've adv- I don't know if you know this, but my next book is on this subject. So I have a vested interest, of course. In I didn't know it, but I'm glad I asked. Um, it's it's still a ways off, so I'm not talking about it much, but I'm doing a Studs Terkel style oral history of the crime drop in the 90s from the police officer's perspective. So I'm asking them what happened. Um, It's one thing to talk about Comstat or Broken Windows or Bill Bratton, but what does that mean? How does that fundamentally change an organization? Um, And a couple things keep coming up. So we're talking primarily, I'm, I'm focusing on the years 93 to 96, and I'm, you know, there's, there's push on both sides of that, but that is when crime dropped 50, when murders dropped 50%, when everyone said it couldn't happen. That was the, the, the miracle of, of the New York city crime drop. And it's continued, but that was the turning point. And the, the answers I constantly receive in it, first of all, that Bill Bratton was a transformational leader along with Jack Maple and Lou Anamone um, and, and Timoney. Um, but they came into a police department and said, and promised, uh, we're going to bring down crime. That was such a radical proposition at the time, because basically since the um, since the Kerner Commission of, of the late 60s, um, the party line was cops don't affect crime, society affects crime. And they just said, to hell with that. We're going to get back into the policing game. Um, Comstat was simply an accountability tool, but it was an essential one. It said we are going to hold precinct commanders responsible for crime. Before it was all about avoiding scandal. That was that was the main issue. If crime went up, eh, you know, crime sometimes goes up. If arrests went up in sync, you were doing fine. Um, the the focus became very much on reducing fear, reducing and reducing crime. Um, broken windows theory was an underlying part of it, but again, it's just a theory. The question is how it is put into practice, um, and that does relate to order maintenance policing. Uh, misdemeanor arrests did go up. Uh, in the in the early years, but it's important to point out, and this is what opponents don't get: um, New York has decarcerated since about the year 2000. There was a bit of a lag because of people in prison, but we have fewer people in jail, far fewer people in jail, but few also drastically fewer people in prison in New York. And this goes counter to the national trends. That's why it's important to emphasize. Um, and in large part, that's because there was less crime, but it showed that you can reduce crime without locking everybody up. Um, a lot of people, more people got arrested, but they're you, you're not doing prison time for these quality of life issues. But it changed the tone of New York City. It changed the culture. OK, you cited CompStat and accountability. And I guess that's information about deploying policing resources as well as incentivizing uh, the policing uh, uh, workforce, men and women, to uh, to uh, be more assiduous in the exercise of their duties. But I mean, what more specifically changed about policing if it, if it wasn't the stopping 
uh, what was it uh, about policing that allowed for such a, a dramatic transformation? Some of it was care- caring about individual players. Okay, you've got five robberies last week. Have you noticed a pattern? I mean, this isn't rocket science. Keith. You might see this, well, don't, didn't they always do this? And the answer was no. But you have a pattern, and you start to see what's going on, and you start to identify individual people responsible for robberies, for shootings, and for burglaries. And you go after those people. And if you only can get them for something small, you do it. And here was another key link, and this one I didn't, I didn't know about. Um, they all talk about increased and good collaboration with uh, the prosecutors. Um, everyone got on board. Um, and that uh, meant that when they did arrest a major player for something small, it got the attention of everybody. Um, but it was it was a strategy. It was a plan. It wasn't so haphazard. Um, but, you know, and this some of this precedes the crime drop in the late 80s. This is under Dinkins. Dinkins also hired a lot of cops. Let's not forget this precedes Giuliani, set the table for Giuliani. Under Dinkins, the squeegee men disappeared, which for some reason people credit to Bratton and Giuliani. But it was an yeah. election issue. But it but they got rid of it before before the the new administration. Um, and they broke up a lot of these major drug gangs, people like the Wild Cowboys and the Supreme Team that were responsible for huge drug operations and, and many, many murders. Um, and that happened um, with prosecutors putting people away for a long time. And that, you know, it's hard to say what the direct impact of that is because a lot of drug crime gets replaced quickly. But there is something about someone who was a role model to a kid perhaps because he was driving around in a fancy car and had lots of money. Um, suddenly, you know, he's upstate for 30 years. He's not so much of a role model. Um, that probably had, uh, probably had some uh, impact in changing the culture. Also, you know, so the drug, drug dealing got pushed inside in New York. <clears throat> Um, that's And that public drug dealing is always a major nexus of violence. It, and partly that's, policing, but also partly, perhaps even more, it's um, technology, because drug dealers went to beepers and then cell phones, and it's a delivery model now. Um, I don't think anyone thinks there are fewer drugs in New York, but the transactions aren't violent anymore. So you can win the war against drug violence without winning the war on drugs. And that Because there's not a guy standing on the corner with 10 grand in his pocket and a pistol tucked in his belt? Yeah. And also, you know, let's not forget making, you know, Facebook boasts and video stuff, because you still have that in cities that have a lot of violence, like Baltimore and Chicago. And that's it's both a cause and an effect of this public drug trade. That's pretty much gone in New York. Um, Other factors that aren't police related, I would put immigration into that. Um, A million New Yorkers moved, a million uh, foreign born people moved into New York in the 1990s. It's about one third foreign born now. Um, Immigrants have lower levels of violence. Uh, that undoubtedly contributed to um, to the violence reduction. It There's also one thing. Can, yeah, go ahead, one, one more culturally, um, you had a large uh, influx of immigrant of black immigrants from the Caribbean and, to a lesser extent, from Africa, um, and that is somewhat unique to New York City. I don't know why in this country we don't tend to look at ethnicity beyond race. Race trumps everything. Um, but the composition of New York City's black population is is very unique and different from other cities in America. And, that and less violent, I take you to be saying. Yeah. I mean, that's that. Then the numbers back that up. And that gets to a cultural argument. But, you know, we can't talk about that. No, we can't. <laughs> um, so there, there are a lot of factors that go uh, that that contributed to this. But certainly police played a role. Um, the crime drop was more in New York. Also, to dispel one myth, um, poverty in New York went up in the 90s. The number of young men in poverty went up. The number of young black men in poverty went up in New York City. That was supposed to be the most important, uh, just, you know, the demographic trends were supposed to trump everything else. And the crime reduction happened despite an increase in what would have been potentially the, um, you know, the most violent demographic group, which is young men 15 to 35. Um, so obviously so you can, you know, I'm not saying that you shouldn't reduce poverty, but at a macro level, it is not a good violent or it's not a good violent reduction plan. And in New York, it, you know, happened despite and crime happened. The crime drop happened in spite of an increase in poverty. This is all very interesting. Uh, one of the things I'm taking away here, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, is that stops are not in and of themselves bad. The marginal stop being unproductive when you're just uh, playing a numbers game is bad. Uh, but uh, the necessary stops are a critical part of effective policing. 
That's exactly what I said, Glenn. You were listening. I like that. Um, <laughs> well, I mean, but, because there are a lot important. of people out there who are going to get, you know, PO'd about uh, stopping in and of itself. The idea that the police is having an interaction with, you know, uh, somebody in the community who's being profiled or suspected or whatever. And they're sort of against stops altogether. And uh, no that's matter not what, what you're saying. No matter what policing tactic you use, if it's hot spots, if it's simply responding to calls for service. I mean, stops are an essential part of policing. And no, it's not pleasant being stopped. I'm probably the only guy who likes being stopped uh, by cops because, you know, I see it as a professional. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> um, I've never had to, like, tell them my background either, but I'm very good at talking to cops. Um, the So, yeah, you, you can't say that. I mean, the idea of policing without stopping and questioning people is you get a 100 percent reactive police force. You can't do that. That said, stops, you know, the legal standard for a stop, a reasonable suspicion is pretty damn low. It's not a difficult standard to meet. So when cops don't meet it, I mean, they really have no excuse. Okay. But can I, you know, so this something recently in New York. So I don't know if you've been following it. There was the arrest of the churros lady. There was a cop who got into a fight and punched a guy in a Brooklyn subway stop that led to protests somewhere. Was it out West in Bart or DC? Somebody was arrested for eating a sandwich on the subway. Um, In all these cases, you know, there, there was a, a, a cop was knocked into a coma with a metal chair last month in, in uh, Brooklyn. Or was it and the block? assailant was killed, right? And the assailant was killed. And a city council person, the first reaction was that she expressed sympathy for the victim, which was the assailant, um, and not the cop who was knocked into a coma. This assailant had red flags. I mean, he was, he was violently mentally ill. Um, his, his mom tried to get him help, and there was no help for him. Was he, he was black? Not even, yes, he was. Uh, yes, he was. Um, the, he wasn't even involved in the incident. There was a guy who was pissing on the floor of a nail salon that the cops responded to, and the cops were arresting that guy on a warrant. And the assailant came in off the sidewalk where he was selling t-shirts and attacked the cops and knocked him into a coma. Um, in the old days, cops had to do something wrong to be criticized. And how cops are actually doing their job and getting criticized. Look, I buy churros from churros ladies in the subway all the time. I love those churros ladies. Um, but at some point, it's against the rules. I'm sorry. Uh, I don't know what churros are. Forgive my uh, Nigeria. Oh, and I'm switching. Yeah, I'm switching incidents here. Um, churros, yeah, are little, the- churros are little Mexican deep fried treats. Okay. And um, one of the sort of known groups of vendors on the subway are little Hispanic ladies, I assume, I presume they're Mexican, I don't know. Um, And they stand there with their little granny carts and they sell churros. Um, Recently it went up to, used to be three for $2. Now it's four for $3, at least at Lexington and 59th. In the subway, on the platform, but not on the train. Correct. Okay. Um, They are noticeably passive, by the way. They're not aggressive sellers. I said, if if you want to get them for selling, it would really be entrapment. Um, but uh, they, they have a soft spot, I think, in, in um, many New Yorkers' heart because, first of all, they're selling sweet treats. Uh, second of all, they're, you know, they're not uh, bothering people or threatening people or anything. Yeah. And there was an, um, and one got arrested two weeks ago, maybe, um, be after cops had told her repeatedly that, you know, she couldn't sell there because it's against the rules. And there were, you know, big protests against that. You know, why are cops... You know, why does it take four cops to arrest a churros lady? Who's she hurting? At some point, I don't know what cops are supposed to do. Um, I will support the churros ladies, but look, it's illegal. And if the cops have given you repeated warnings, you can't do it. Um, I don't, we're, we're reaching a point in New York where cops are getting in trouble for enforcing legally existing rules and, you know, doing so properly. Um, I don't know where that leads. Somebody is going to say, Peter, this is the bitter fruit of bad policing for decades. And there's been a reaction and there's been a movement. Black Lives Matter is a part of it. They're going to run down the list of the incidents from the Eric Garners to the Freddie Grays and so on. Uh, They're going to say that, and I know you've heard all of this, uh, the public has lost confidence, or at least the public of color, the minority public, the impoverished public have lost confidence in uh, police. And what you're seeing is a kind of backlash or expression of um, contempt and uh, rage. I mean, what about this soaking uh, with the uh, spray guns of the water that just sprayed on police officers and whatnot that uh, I heard uh, 
uh, William Barr, uh, the attorney general of the United States, in a speech a couple of months ago, uh, outraged about the president of the United States even addressed himself to it. Isn't this merely aren't the cops reaping what they've sown? Isn't this merely chickens coming home to roost? I don't think so. When was the glory days? When when did everyone love and respect the cops? Um, I noticed that, first of all, a lot of the protests, um, and I'm not at them personally, but based on pictures I see of the protests, they're disproportionately white for a city like New York. Um, I think a lot of the opposition is coming from white progressives who are punching their progressive cards so they sleep better at night, and they don't live in the neighborhoods that are really dangerous, so it's very easy for them to do. Um, there's something incredibly paternalistic about telling other people how they should be policed. Um, if the complaints come from within the communities, I, you know, then let's talk. But despite sort of a loud anti-policing crowd, you know, African-Americans um, respect police, you know, not as much as whites, not as you know, often as whites do, but still the numbers of like, you know, basic polling data, do you respect your police? It's always favorable. Um, there is a loud vocal minority, but I don't think that reflects the majority of people who are, you know, getting up and having to deal with quality of life issues and, and you know, are busy working two jobs and trying to raise kids. So they're not going to do these protests. But I mean, with that, with the water bucket throwing. So to tell your viewers, so there was a yeah. trend last summer, almost a fad of people going up to cops, uh, in a car or while they're arresting someone and dumping buckets of water on them. Um, and the cops reacting without uh, passively to that, just taking it. And a lot of people applauded that. And look, I, you know, I never want cops to take the bait, but you can't do that to cops. Um, there is a question of authority and how close you can get and what you could be throwing. Um, that person has to be grabbed and arrested and, 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 you know, they're not really going to prosecute much for that. But anyway, but but it's not acceptable. Um, you know, cops are trying to do their job and you've just taken, you know, and, and it's in, and I don't want to imply direct cause and effect, but I'm saying there's a similarity between dumping water buckets and this guy bashing a cop with a metal chair. Um, was he inspired by the idea that this is what you're supposed to do with cops being arrested? I don't know. Um, the guy had some, you know, serious problems beyond that. But what led him to think that intervening in a in a lawful arrest was was the right response? Um, now you can say, oh, it's years of police oppression. But look, this guy had attacked his grand. I mean, he had he had attacked many people, including his family members. Um, so if you want to blame cops, you know, history of racist policing for all of that, go ahead. I just I, at some point it's it's a weak argument. But but we're so polarized now. I'm I'm wondering. Now, here you are saying you can't do that to a cop. You know, you, you're uh, undermining authority. You're, you're you know, uh, uh, in, impeding the uh, prosecution of the public business and so on. And yet a lot of people think they can do it to cops. And what I'm not hearing is uh, many people speaking against that who are not already, in some sense, disqualified because they're on the right of the political spectrum. I mean, I am hearing Attorney General William Barr speaking against it. And I'm hearing comments out of uh, the, the president's tweeting uh, uh, activity against it. But what I'm not hearing are uh, candidates for uh, president the, in the Democratic, for the Democratic Party nomination for president. Uh, yeah. Saying it when you might think that would be a way of getting uh, uh, a real a purchase on this kind of moderate center uh, position in the in the political jousting that's going on. And one, uh, of, them, one of them might, though, to pull out. I mean, you know, so it would be the. The 2020 version of, of a sister soldier moment, perhaps. Right. Um, but the idea that yeah, all the Democratic candidates are sort of lining up on one side uh, is, you know, they don't have skin in, the, in that game. I mean, they got skin in their own game, but it's very easy to just sort of say cops are always wrong. Um, and that's kind of what's going on to, to a large part, at least on the political left. I don't know where the end game is for that. Um, it's, or, you know, the end game might be if, if, you know, crime goes up again and then, you know, it happens in their neighborhood and suddenly they demand, you know, aggressive and even potentially illegal police action to do something about those about those people. I mean, you might see that again. Look, when when Giuliani came on uh, in the early 90s as mayor, um, when he was only slightly crazy and more covertly racist than he is now. But when he came on, he was responding <laughs> to, you know, a certain city at a certain time um, and, you know, the city elected Giuliani as mayor. Like, imagine that happening in New York City. That, that's how different the time was. Yeah. Um, and hopefully, you know, we won't have to go back that's to 2,000 murders a year to get that. 
Yeah. Um, okay, you had mentioned de-policing. Uh, can you say a little bit more about that? I mean, uh, I, I saw a paper uh, by Roland Fryer. It's not yet uh, uh, been put out for public dissemination, so I probably shouldn't say too much about it, but um, he's worried about the police reacting to a pattern in practice investigations of local police departments by uh, the feds uh, in ways that actually end up leading to more crime because police don't want to be caught in the position of doing something that might uh, lead to uh, negative blowback for them, even though they're simply doing their jobs. Uh, so, and, you know, Heather McDonald has uh, made a lot out of the so-called war on cops and withdrawal of police from uh, more active engagement in uh, 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 dealing with lawbreakers, uh, which again is leading to increases in uh, violent crime in, in some cities. I'm wondering, first of all, just what are the facts about de-policing? And secondly, whether or not uh, you think that there's some connection to, between de-policing and the uh, uptick that we've seen in homicide in cities like St. Louis, Baltimore, Chicago uh, in the last few years? You know, policing is local. So let me start by saying that. So when I talk about de-policing, it, it's not a national trend. I mean, it could be a national trend. It's not inherently a national trend. There were specific incidents in these cities um, that led to de-policing that you can quantify and, you know, you can talk to people and hear about it as well. Um, but you just see a, a massive decrease in on-view incidents, which means the cops use something and does something. I uh, see a decrease in stops. And, you know, I was on Twitter last night saying it's not, I don't like looking at stops um, as, a, they're, uh, as a measure of good, but they're a proxy measure often for proactive policing. If you combine it with decreased arrests, decreased, you know, on-view drug offenses, you see many signs of cops doing less in certain cities and violence going up in those cities. And Which I'm, cities? Chicago, uh, 2016, Baltimore, 2015. Um, there are other St. Louis, though I don't, I, you know, I don't look at every, I, I follow certain cities that I've lived in or worked in. Okay, so Baltimore, the incident is Freddie Gray. Chicago, the incident is Laquan McDonald. Am I That's reading related. Right? Laquan was part of that. Um, it, but um, it was also uh, a quick sort of semi-correction. In Baltimore, it was Freddie Gray, but it was specifically Marilyn Mosby charging the cops involved in the incidents who had legally cleared a drug corner. And she charged them with a variety of crimes and won zero convictions because it was a somewhat absurd set of trials. Um, but she told cops that um, if you legally clear a drug corner, um, I might charge you criminally. That that had a huge impact on policing in Baltimore. I said, okay, if you don't want us to, we won't. That's, you know, that's fine. Uh, and they didn't. And violence went up immediately by, by you know, two thirds. Let, let, me, let me put this sharply, if I'm following you, and correct me if I'm not. There are black people in Baltimore who were murdered and who would otherwise have been alive because the African-American district attorney decided to have a political show trial in which police officers who were doing their job clearing a drug corner, which led to the unfortunate death of Freddie Gray, were charged in a silly way that anyone with sense could have known wasn't going to lead to convictions just in order to placate a mob. What did I say that was wrong? Um, I would say placate a mob is wrong. Okay. Um, uh, <laughs> but 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 if we t- if we take out that element, um, the rest of it, and I'll say I'll say this: that the driver of the van in which Freddie Gray almost died, he died soon after, um, bears certainly responsibility because prisoners are not allowed to die in your custody. Um, whether that's criminal or civil, it, you know, it can be debated. And in hindsight, it wasn't criminal um, and it, it was civil. But okay, so that's con- a negligence kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, Potentially. Uh, so I think, you know, that that I that unfortunate officer, I think, had to face some consequences and he did. Uh, but the other ones involved, the, the irony, by the way, the ultimate irony is this corner was given special attention because of a re- request from the prosecutor's office because it was near a church and the church members didn't like all the drug activity on a Sunday morning, which is why the cops were there on a Sunday morning. Um, Freddie ran. Wow. Cops legally chased. Cops legally stopped. Cops legally arrested him on a very minor charge, by the way. But, you know, he was arrested partly. He, he was arrested because he ran and was caught. Um, but it was legal. It, you know, the arrest was petty, but it was legal. So, yeah, the, char- the, the, the trials were a joke. Um, 
But the cops almost won a countersuit, which was tough because prosecutors are granted absolute immunity. But it, it went surprisingly far in the court system before absolute immunity won out against malicious prosecution. OK, um, so the Chicago or do you got more on Baltimore? Yeah, Chicago. Um, it was a combination of LaCroix and McDonald. There was a cover up. Let's not forget a cover up that went right to the mayor. Um, yeah. uh, and then independent of that, the ACLU um, changed the form for stop, question, and frisk that Chicago cops had to do. For a while, it was a very long form. It's since been shortened. Um, but cops told me, and whether it's, I think it is partly true, but whether it's true or not is in a way secondary to whether cops believe it to be true, that these forms were then going to the ACLU who could potentially sue cops for uh, false arrest. Um, that is, and so stops stopped happening, um, both because of paperwork, because of low morale, and because of fear of getting sued if you didn't dot your I's and cross your T's. Um, let's also remember when people analyze the legality of low-level arrests, um, it is based entirely on what the officer wrote. So officers who aren't smart enough to write the right thing, I hold them at fault. But there's also a case um, where officers simply leave out the information they're supposed to put in because they, A, don't care, B, aren't smart enough to understand the legal standard that, they're, that they should understand, um, and C, think it doesn't matter. Um, so you, you, you can get situations where the actual arrest um, or the stop was legal, but the, because the officer didn't articulate it, it's therefore not legal. But then, so there's some gray there even in that. Then, mind you, sometimes cops do just stop people without legal grounds. Okay. I'm not saying that doesn't happen. But in Chicago, um, cops stopped uh, interacting with, with criminals. And, you know, and, this, and murders double. Like, these increases are so dramatic and so quick. And then people are left sort of shrugging. And yet, the, you know, we're never supposed to say we can't prove correlation equals causality. But it's also important to say just because something is correlated doesn't mean it's not causal. I mean, you've got a lot of evidence on one side. And then people who don't want to say police matter talk about, oh, you know, three rec centers closed here. I just read last week in the in the paper, someone said the crime went up in Baltimore because in part because the subway wasn't expanded in 2015. Um, you know, I'm all for the red line in Baltimore, but that no, that is not <laughs> why violence increased in 2015. I'm struck by the irony of this, though. I mean, you have this movement, Black Lives Matter, and you have this agitation in the country about, uh, you know, justice for Freddie Gray and so on. Um, and uh, that you have on the one side, and that leads to a set of, uh, of dynamics, uh, political and legal, changing the environment in which police officers are operating, uh, associated with deep policing and disengagement with the consequence of uh, higher victimization and loss of life uh, amongst black and brown people in uh, low-income districts of uh, the big cities. Um, who is who's putting their finger on this? Who's talking about this besides you uh, and Heather McDonald? Not to not that you guys are uh, equivalent or whatever, but I hear similar sounds coming out of her. Uh, but I, I really don't hear very much pushback against the um, anti-police uh, progressive uh, sentiment that I mean, in fact, I'm seeing DAs get elected in cities around the country campaigning almost explicitly on the we're going to get rid of cash bail. We're going to stop bringing uh, low-level uh, criminal offenses. We're going to, you know, empty the jails and so forth and so on. And uh, I don't see a whole lot of pushback against that. People don't see the potential. And look, maybe they're right. I hope they are. Um, we're, you know, virtually ending cash bail in New York on January 1st, along with other huge changes. Most of those changes are good, by the way. There are some very much I worry about. Um specifically things like robbery two and burglary two, which means a sort of non-forceful street robbery. Um, that person cannot be detained on bail. Someone caught in your house uh, unarmed um, cannot be detained on bail. Uh, what if that person lives next door to you? And they're going to, and also New York, unlike other states that have successfully done a lot of this, New York has an odd provision, which said judges are not allowed to use public safety as a determining factor to keep someone in jail on bail. That opens up a lot of problems. Um, and I'm afraid that you're going to get more cases of this guy who attacked the cop, of Santos who killed four homeless people in Chinatown, people who were clear threats, um, people for whom family members tried to get help um, and no help is available uh, because they didn't want to get be committed, um, people who were bailed out 
um, by progressive organizations from Rikers and then killed people. Um, eventually, you know, the public's not going to take that. And, they're, you know, it's the backlash that scares me a bit. Um, that said, a lot of the reforms are good. You know, many people don't have to be kept in jail. The discovery laws in New York are a little, had been a little uh, extreme on the side of lack of discovery. Um, but, you know, th- those are political choices. My problem is when district attorneys or prosecutors, call them what you use, state's attorneys, is when they simply decide, um, because of the power that they have, and it's a lot, that we're not going to enforce the laws as they're written. Um, they can set policy. The police department, to some extent, has to play along with them, or else they get no, no you know, our cases won't be prosecuted. Um, and it's very easy to win these elections. That's where I got to give some credit to the political uh, hardball of it. Um, the the prosecutor in Queens won the primary. I hope this number is right. It's off the top of my head. It was something like 40,000 votes. This is a borough of, in an election that was decided by 25 votes. This is the Democratic primary, mind you, but that's yeah. but the Democratic primary is the real election. That's the election, yeah. So no one votes. This is a borough of 2.3 million people. This yeah. is an important job, the prosecutor. And yeah. at some point, the job of the prosecutor is a search for truth. At another point, you want someone who can actually prosecute. There's a nitty gritty, you know, it's, it's a large organization that has to get a job done. And so to elect people on ideology or theory that they're saying the right things about the criminal justice system, you know, that's fine if you're the public advocate. Um, it's not good if your job is to lead a large prosecution um, or a large prosecutor's office. You know, th- these aren't joke jobs. Um, I will question whether they should even be elected uh, because I don't think we're doing a good job at electing these very important positions. Of course, you could also do, I mean, in New York, the system is rigged to encourage low turnout because the idea was then the, you know, the Democratic par- primary can pick the winners. Um, I mean, it's, 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 a, it's a dirty system in many ways, but the, but the answer, I don't think, is this uh, wave of sort of anti-prosecution prosecutors. Okay. I mean, it's, it's an adversarial system of justice, you know. Um, DAs, defense attorneys have their side, and, you know, it, it's supposed to be adversarial. If you get defense attorneys on both sides... But, you know, we'll see to some extent. Um, Looking at a few cities like Philadelphia under Krasner, murders have gone up. Of course, there's no accountability. though. I mean, I don't know. Someone else can explain to me my murders are up in Philly, but down next door in Camden. Um, I don't know how much of of that is the prosecutor's office. Um, I think some of it is, though. Feels like a natural experiment to me. There's just a little river between those two places. Very easy to get from one to the other. Yeah. I mean, you can also look at New York City and Newark, New Jersey, their natural experiments, um, not so much with prosecution, but with, say with gun possession and gun violence. Um, one of the many fascinating things about New York City being an anomaly in almost everything is a, by a U.S. standards, a very low percentage of murders are committed with guns. Um, I think it's in the 60 some percent where nationally it's 80 percent. And in big cities, it's often higher. Um, so not only do we have very few murders in New York City by American standards, but we also, the murders that happen are not with guns. Um, I, I, without too much confidence, I would say that is because of a very strong uh, prosecution of gun offenders. That, you know, that's one that seems like should span the ideological uh, boundaries between liberals and conservatives and progressives and, and the crazy right. Getting um, tough on gun offenders. To, to enforce existing gun laws. I don't know anyone who's against that in theory, but in practice, um, it, it often doesn't happen. Yeah. Okay, well, um, I think we're at the end of the uh, time that I've allotted for this conversation, Peter. Uh, I want to thank you for uh, giving us some of your uh, insight and wisdom and uh, look forward to doing this again sometime in the near future. It's always a pleasure, Glenn. Okay, take care, my friend. Bye-bye.